This is the next Bite of Life podcast, the place to be to hear personal stories from expats, digital nomads, and everybody else taking their next bite of life. Welcome to another episode of the Next Bite of Life podcast. I am so excited to have my next guest here because it's been a long time since I've been wanting to talk to her and discuss with her all about life in Spain and life before and after. So may I introduce Shakira Stova. Hi. Hello. I'm so glad you could join me today. I know that you are like superwoman and you have so many things to do, but you were able to squeeze me in. (laughs) Everyone has a million things to do these days, I swear. (laughs) Well, you are one busy woman. I'm going to let everybody know right off the bat, you are a mom. (laughs) Yeah. You have your partner. You have three kids, three boys three boys i mean that alone is a lot of work but not only that you are a bicontinental woman i have to say because you know let let me let you tell us what is it um that you do for a living and where you do it and i think that's really interesting to a lot of people Well, uh, I'm a nurse. I'm a registered nurse. I was trained in the U.S. That's where all of my certifications are. Um, When I'm in Spain, uh, I teach English or have up until the pandemic. When the pandemic started, I kind of faltered some and then went completely to nursing because that's where the help was needed more. Um, But when I'm in the U.S., uh, I'm a registered nurse and, and not a teacher. So year round public servant. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> I think that's absolutely amazing. And I said bicontinental because, you know, I know during, during the COVID crisis, the next, every time I saw you, I'm like, oh my God, she's on the next plane and she's out there helping. What was it like when this first happened? I mean, you were in Spain when all this COVID thing happened. What was your reaction as far as like, I need to do something? Well, I, I mean, Obviously, working in the medical field um, and being part of groups online, you you start hearing stuff maybe a little bit sooner than other people might be hearing them. And you know kind of what to really look for. Uh, obviously, not paying attention to uh, the, the fear-mongering news or politicians, but paying attention to what scientists and doctors are saying and saying. So the last day before we had spring break here, when things were really ramping up and everybody wasn't sure what was going on, I came to school in a mask and got sent home. Wow. <laughs> yeah. It so was a like, public school. Wow. I came to school in the, uh, the public school in the mask. I said, no, I see what's going on. We have an idea of how it's spreading um this is dangerous this is (laughs) yeah exactly and yeah and the the secretary said to me no I guess I said like don't do that and I said I I'm not going to not do it so if you guys want me here today this is how it is 10 minutes later the principal came to the class and said if you feel that way we kind of need you to go home because we feel like you might scare the students and the parents Mm. Because at that point, nobody knew and they were just scared, you know? Wow. (laughs) It's, it's just amazing. I mean, I heard about it from friends. Like they were like, you know, we've been having doctors write this prescriptions and we asked them what's going on, you know? And they're like, we're using this antibiotic and this antiviral together. And so there's like, there's something going on. We don't know what it is, but it's coming. And then all of a sudden, like the country just went into shutdown and (laughs) Were you scared at that point? Because, you know, you wanted obviously to go help back in the U.S., but all the flights were shot. How were you able to even get out and get over there? As a U.S. citizen, they did have some flights that were going back specifically for citizens. If you were out of the country and you belong to another country, then you could go back to that country. Okay. Um, for a little while. <laughs> for a little while. <laughs> now, how did it, you know, let, let's 
maybe even move it back a little bit further. How did you end up in Spain and in Valencia? How did that come about from the U.S.? Oh, from the U.S. Um, do you want the real answer or the answer I give the Spaniards? <laughs> Whichever one you think. <laughs> Whichever one. Whichever one. Is, just remember it's on YouTube. Answers. Just remember it's on YouTube. So if they if they if they can understand, they'll know what it is. <laughs> okay. So uh, and they're both true, mm -hmm. but they're just uh, different parts of my journey. Okay. So when people here ask me, I, I tell them that I wanted my children to have um, a multicultural experience and to learn another language, which we tried in the U.S., but it's really difficult yeah. to keep it up and for them to really gain true fluency without immersion. Yeah. Um, and the cost of living here and the yeah. life work balance yes. uh, in the U.S., we were, me and my husband both, because he's an economist, were working like crazy to be able to maintain a decent life. We had a, a good standard li of living, but it, it required an insane amount of like constant work to be able to maintain it. Yeah. So, so how long? You know, that two weeks of vacation. Oh yeah. <laughs> I know. It's so amazing the difference. I mean, it's just that's what I hear a lot. It's like the the lifestyle, apart from the cost of living, of course, is very important. I hear lifestyle, uh, cost of living, and healthcare. I mean, those three things basically. That's we left because that was the overriding factor for us. In addition to what you said, because it got to the point where even though we wanted to stop working and we could stop working, but we could not, we must, we, we couldn't because we couldn't afford the healthcare once the company wasn't kicking in their part. I mean, it was like over $2,000. Where are you going to get that? You need to work to be able to pay for that. And so it just didn't make any sense. And so we were looking for alternatives. Now, when you left, how long have you been in Spain now? We've been here for four and a half years. Okay. Now, four and a half years, yeah. So you've got three kids, three boys, right? And one of the questions that people always ask me is, how is it? And a lot of times I interview people with no kids or they're retired. And I am interested to know, for not just for me, but for everybody else, how is it? being a mother of three kids with like the schooling and being able to have them integrate into Spanish life. Oh, wow. How much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> um, but let's, let's take it, uh, I guess one step at a time. Okay. When we first got here, the first year was awful. Okay. It was terrible. Yeah. It was a huge adjustment. Um, we didn't know what we didn't know. Okay. So we moved here and we got assigned to Basque Country for our, for our language assistant positions. Okay. Uh, I had never heard of Basque Country uh, and I <laughs> kind of Googled a little bit. The only reason we even chose that as an option is because our first two options um, were full and they emailed us asking if we wanted the third one. Okay. Uh, and that one had beaches. That's it. And you're just like uh, <laughs> that, was yeah. the, that was the deciding factor for in that column of availability. That one was the only one that had beaches. Ah. <laughs> so you're like, there you go. <laughs> yeah. But we looked online and a little bit worried because of the history with independence and ETA. And um, for I, people who don't know, it was it was a a very bloody struggle for a very long time going into the two thousands. The language, um, <laughs> the language. I thought it would be more like the U.S., where there are areas that have a prevalence of another language, but still everything's done in the main language. That's still it, exactly. No, and that's <laughs> not. That wasn't it. I wasn't prepared for that. So when the children went to school, they went to public school. Oh. From, yeah, they had to learn yeah. Basque and Spanish at yeah. the same time. Uh huh. <laughs> and their language so, is completely, oh, it's different. It's just different. 
Well, it's different than anything. It's a language isolate. So it's not related to any other language. The Mm -hmm. sentence structure, the conjugation, um, plurality, all of it's completely different than Spanish or English or French or any other language. So that was really hard because all of their classes, except for Spanish and English, were in Basque. So it wasn't even 50-50. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> and so then you must as have soon been as the kids went them. outside to play, they switched to Spanish. Yeah. Uh, I can't even imagine how difficult that, that must have been. I mean, for them too, even though they're young and kids are like sponges, but still it's difficult, you know? I mean, it was, like, so that, that's what made it so difficult. You know, the, the one thing that I remember the kids doing really well at was math. Because it didn't have anything to do with <laughs> languages. <laughs> so you encourage that. It's like, at least I'll get three mathematicians, right? <laughs> <laughs> at least that, that is the universal language, apparently. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so now, when did you leave the Basque country then? We were there for two years okay. and we loved it. Okay. We really did. Um, like I said, the first year, huge culture shock. The people there are a bit more reserved. Mm -hmm. Um, It's more like the North in the U S where when they know you and they trust you, it's, it's real. You're like part of the family, but until then it's kind of an arm's length thing. They're not rude, Mm -hmm. but not not very warm and open. And they're just more quiet and reserved. Um, That was hard to make friends, to develop connections. And as an immigrant that, you know, as people, that's what we need. We people need community. And that was really, really difficult in the beginning. Um, We wanted to stay though. Mm -hmm. We loved um, it's very timely, which Mm -hmm. is not a very Spanish thing, very organized, um, just very like, I I love that about it. It's nicknamed German. No mañana. Okay. No mañana. No, (laughs) No, everything ran like clockwork. It was beautiful. Wow. <laughs> um, but it's expensive. Yeah. Yeah. It's very expensive. And we yeah. couldn't afford to buy a house there. Yeah. And by yeah. the end of the second year, we realized that we we were finally had gotten into a good rhythm. Mm-hmm. We wanted to make Spain home. Okay. And that's um, how Valencia came into the picture. Absolutely. I had a list. Uh-huh. I'm a very organized person. So I had, a, and even if it wasn't going to be home forever, we wanted a permanent base that we could always come back to, come back to. no matter where we yeah. lived in the world. Yeah. So on the list was because the first two years, like I said, we didn't know what we didn't know. A hospital within 15 minutes. Okay. I have three kids. Mm-hmm. That was on the list. Exactly. A town big enough to have a library, mm-hmm. a sports center. Yeah. Uh, and at least two grocery stores. Oh, very important. Uh, <laughs> that that's important. To, I know that sounds weird, but the town no. that we lived in before, Berra de Vida Soa, was technically in Navarre, even though it's an historical Basque country. One grocery store that closes at two o'clock every day. Mm, that makes that's things it. a lot difficult. Yeah. So yeah. Y- you had your criteria, and you crossed off all the cities, and Valencia came up ahead. Valencia was not Valencia, Sagunto. Sagunto, okay. <laughs> we wanted to live, uh, that was on the list too, close to a major city, but not in a major city because we wanted the kids to have a life where they could run around town with their friends mm-hmm. and they have a lot more. It's like when I was a kid mm-hmm. um, visiting my mom, no, my, sorry, not my mom, visiting my grandma in Cleveland. Mm-hmm. She would just send us outside and Good we way. would go to play with our friends and go to the corner store or the park or the library or whatever. We just had to tell her where we were going to be. And then in the U S yeah, you can't do that now. (laughs) Times have changed. You really can't. No, you cannot. And it's not even because of personal fear um, because that's the case for a lot of people. They're uncomfortable. What before we left, we were living in an apartment complex in Roswell, Georgia, Mm -hmm. and it was, a nice place, gated mm-hmm. community, swimming pool, tennis court, the works. 
uh, we let them go to the playground that was in the apartment complex. Mm -hmm. Keep in mind, they're 12, 9, and my nephew was 11 that went with them. So it's in the apartment complex. And there was a man that yelled at them and said he was going to call the police because he knew they didn't live there and they shouldn't be climbing trees. It's dangerous oh is the excuse he gave yeah, my husband. Yeah, yeah. My husband came. This is just insane. I mean, I don't know how things have changed. So how things could have changed so rapidly from when we were, you know, when we were kids and you could play and you could do all these things. And now this, this helicopter parents and you can't even go out, call me every 10 minutes. It's like, I know that, but kids should be allowed to be kids. And they're so, so you feel, no. So anyway, I won't go into the lecture, but you feel better with your two, three boys in Spain because obviously life for them is much better and you feel calmer letting them out there to play. Well, it's not even me feeling calm. I felt like in the, in the apartment complex with security cameras and everything like that, I, and the three of them there, one of them could run back to our apartment if they needed anything yeah, yeah. i felt comfortable with that but the society doesn't let you so it's even if you feel comfortable other people oh, are threatening they i mean i've heard of a woman getting you know her six-year-old son i think the news article said was playing in her backyard by himself and the neighbor and called the okay there's just yeah that's just crazy that is just crazy but what do you do it is, but that's the thing. Like, it's it's not just you at that yeah, point. Yeah. If the society isn't on that page, you alone can't change it. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And there's it's, so many experiences I had as a kid that I could never have had if my mom was like covered. Was like, yeah, exactly. So you know, now I mean, I see pictures of your kids and they're just having fun and they're being kids. I mean, and that's the way it should be. And you sort of feel sorry on one hand for the parents because you feel like you can't even let your kids be kids. But on the other hand, I feel more sorry for the kids because they're not allowed to experience all this. And I think we may not see it when they're young, but certainly when they get older, you see the effects of like the helicopter and all these things. And I used to say like working, I have people like for interviews, the parents will call and say, you know, my, yeah, my daughter wants a job as an, you know, as a technician there. And I'm like, why isn't your daughter calling? Well, she's not used to doing it. Or they show up for the interview with the kids. And I'm just like, <laughs> I've had parents fly from California to Texas because the guy, the kid got a boo-boo in college. You know, the kid is at Rice University. It's like, okay, now you sign here for the lady. And now you, and I'm thinking to myself, oh my God, times have really, really, really changed. And I'm just like, <laughs> who do you blame? I don't know. Society, you know, the parents, the kids, I don't know. But this is just the way it is now. Now, talk now to I me. will say, oh, sorry. No, 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 go ahead, please. I will say as far as like independence from mothers um, and, and doing things officially, Spain is not that far ahead. No? <laughs> no. And I See, say I don't that know. because I have friends that I know that are dating or things like that. And they swear these guys can't do anything on their own because their it's mothers have always taken, the moms have taken care of them. They still, I've worked with teachers it's in true. their 30s that live with their parents still and and that's just the culture yeah um and even going to the the doctor with my son and me like uh i remember one of the doctors complimenting my son for knowing so much about his own like medical history, history and stuff and i was like oh that's really nice you know he he's really young i'm trying to get him to be independent and he looked at how old he is because I don't know if you've, my son is 6'3". Yeah, yeah. <laughs> is and, and he, at that time, he was 6'1 and 15. So he thought my son was like in his 20s. Yeah. And doing this. Because <laughs> exactly. he said so. He's like, oh, I thought you were in your early 20s. Because the mask, the mask. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you can't tell. little baby. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what he expected. So in that respect it's still very much very. A, a culture that 
that's still I don't know about the calling for a job that one yeah. I don't know or showing up that yeah. one I don't know but yeah. it's still very like the moms are are they're, they're those are their babies, babies for a long time of course see of course <laughs> <laughs> how have you found like the healthcare um here compared to maybe I should say healthcare costs or healthcare itself and healthcare itself in general with three boys, especially where they're going to break something, I'm sure. Or yeah, yeah. no, it's happened already. Of okay. course, of course. Uh, we've been here for four and a half years. Yeah, mm-hmm. we've, we've been there a few times and lots mm-hmm. of doctor visits and all kinds of stuff. Um, I'm going to tell you the same way that I tell people here when they ask, because I'll say it's better here. Mm-hmm. And the, oh, you think so? It does not matter what I think. The numbers. <laughs> the stats, the, the worldwide ranking, the objective measures show very clearly that Spain is in the top 10 and the U.S. is hovering in the 30s. And so, so the it, numbers it, don't lie. <laughs> the numbers don't lie. And there's a lot of reasons why. One, there's a ton of preventative care here. Because of the way the way this because it's a public system, there's a ton of preventative care. Mm-hmm. So an ounce of prevention. Yeah, that's true. Um, you, you don't have a you don't you're not scared to go to the doctor when something is wrong instead of letting it fester. So you don't have people coming in in crisis all the time, mm-hmm. and when they get that far gone, it can be really difficult to help pull them through to the other side with a great quality of life. Yeah. Um, so they have that preventative care for their whole life. There's more education in the school system and especially around food. Food is a huge, huge, uh, contributor to a lot of our health problems in the U S and here they very young, they have very balanced meals for lunch. They only drink water with lunch. Yeah. Um, they, they learn how to eat well and eat a really big variety of healthy, fresh foods. Fresh. <laughs> fresh. Fresh that if you don't eat it within a few days, it goes rotten fresh. <laughs> exactly. I just threw a bunch of stuff in my compost yesterday. <laughs> yeah. It's like, <laughs> yeah. Because it's like, you've got three days to use this once you open it. That's it, you know? That's and that's it. good, you know? It, Without all the preservatives. Exactly. And, yeah. So that's a and pesticide. Like it's, There's a lot more things that are allowed in the food in the U.S. that aren't allowed in the foods here. That contributes to health. So the healthcare system has less crisis to start with, but they also have more nurses and more doctors. That's why you'll see ads in the newspapers here from Sweden, from Germany, from Ireland and the U.K. in Spanish for nurses in those countries Mm -hmm. those countries are trying to poach nurses because spain has an excess Mm. so much of an excess that the nurses i've talked to here some of them will go 10 or more years without a permanent position because because it's so hard to get one because there's so many nurses got it so when you have that many caretakers and the system is already set up for you to succeed with the prevention i'm not I can't say definitively whether the treatments available are better Mm -hmm. because that's not the case Mm -hmm. It's the system is set up for everyone to succeed. Where in the U S you can get, I mean, world-class possibly better treatment in a lot of cases. If you have a lot of money. Yeah. It, It all boils down to, to that. Doesn't it? It's all about the money. It's all about the money. So that makes that I've, I've been in situations where, where, you know, different patients are prescribed different things and you know, it's because of the insurance or lack thereof. And that's hard. Yeah. That's, that's hard to see. And comes in because I don't have anything to do with the billing. I don't get paid more. Yeah. Yeah. Um, That's thank. I'm very thankful and grateful for that, but it, it is hard to see. Um, and to know that, that there is this huge, huge disparity in care okay. that yeah. isn't the same here. That's, you know, do you feel the same way about the school? 
like for the kids, it must have been hard for them to adjust because first of all, they had to learn the Basque language. And then you move to Valencia region and you have to switch to Valenciano for those watching or listening. Valenciano yeah. is like the school kids have to be thought like 70% in the main language and then 30% in Castilian, the regular Spanish. So they had to shift from one Basque to now Valenciano and Eng I mean, and Spanish. How was that adjusted, you know, adjustment for them? I have to say it was good that they were able to manage Spanish with another completely non-related language first because then they can hear the difference between Spanish and Valencian okay. a lot better than I can. So that actually turned, like if they were learning Spanish and Valencian at the same time, because they're so closely related, they're mm -hmm. both romance languages that share a lot of words. Um, I feel like that actually might have worked to their benefit. Okay, got it. So that turned out to be an okay thing, but... If I could do it all over again, I definitely would have picked one region and stuck to it because yeah. it has been real. The only one of the kids that still speaks Basque is my middle son. Okay. Um, and he has one lesson a week just to kind of keep it up keep so it that up. he doesn't lose it. Mm -hmm. But he's the only one that really, um, really got to, to a decent level of fluency um, that he could continue. It, it's just, it, it, that was hard. So enrolling them in the public school was a blessing and a curse. Now I'm glad we did it. Um, I didn't know that we would have to get in Padron before we could get them put in a school here. Okay. So it took like a month the first time yes. to actually get them into a school. Cause I didn't know how the system worked. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, the schools here, as long as you are registered in uh, a province, mm -hmm. you can send your kids to any school in that whole province. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that. And that's very different than in the U.S. where it hasn't happened often. But, I mean, anyone can Google it. There have been cases of people sending their children to schools they're not district for and getting arrested. Yeah, I know. Which is just crazy. Jail time. Yeah. I actually thought it was the same here that, you know, you had to register your padron and then you had to stay within the same little neighborhood. I actually thought it was, no. but you're saying it's actually the whole pro. Oh, that's pretty good. Okay. You do get extra points. Like there's a point system. If the mm -hmm. school is going to be very, very full. like you get one extra point. If the school that you're registering for is the same district you live in. Okay. Gotcha. So, that's so there is a that. small amount of preference, mm -hmm. but if you register early enough, then you can get into most schools that you would want to get into. That's not an issue. It's not like in the U.S. where this neighborhood pays this amount of taxes and their schools are getting money from this amount of taxes. So they're better equipped than literally like two blocks over <laughs> where those children's buildings residences pay less taxes so they have less resources mm. here the schools get paid in general from what mm -hmm. i understand by how many students they have and gotcha. how many extra activities they supply okay so it's there's not this i've worked in four different schools and my husband has also worked in four different schools <laughs> and between the three of the kids they've gone to other schools and so I've seen schools from, you know, a community of 3,000 for the whole town to, you know, over 60,000, mm -hmm. which is Sagunto now. Yeah. And there has, even the, the kids in the tiny little mountain pueblo that I was at had, you know, I, the, the little tablets and the touch boards and new books and, you know, after school activities. It wasn't based on the money of the neighborhood. Gotcha. gotcha. And, and that's huge because that's from the beginning, you know? And then the, the free childcare from ages three on, ages two on in some areas. Hmm. Like not childcare, but the preschool. It's free. Yeah. yeah. 
Wow. <laughs> Quite a difference. Right? Whereas in the U.S., it's like a, you're paying like a mortgage to send your child to daycare. And then so, it's right? I know. It's a lot. I've done it. <laughs> you're listening to the next Fight of Life podcast. Please support the show by either subscribing or buying me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash chemchem. Thanks again for listening. Now back to the show. And I got to ask you, you know, I know that no place is perfect. Are there some things that you miss so much about the U.S. that you can say, you know, it was definitely better there or is everything great? No, um, obviously, for most most of us, it's family. Um, of course, I miss my family. Well, like nobody's business. That one's super hard. I have no family. Here. Yeah. Uh, other than, you know, my 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 husband and my kids that's it um so you start to create uh new family members almost (laughs) yes it's true Um, it's very true yeah so that that's i still obviously miss my mom and sister and brothers and stuff um being able to kind of have a general understanding of how things work here Adulting anywhere is hard. Adulting in a foreign ca- country in a, a completely different language is that multiplied by 20. There's just, I have to always go back again and again because there's something I've missed or something I didn't do and they don't mm-hmm. understand why I don't know this already. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can and understand so, that. <laughs> yeah, I've that one that's hard and just being able to go in somewhere and not have every conversation be hard work yeah it's you don't realize i mean you say everybody tells me oh spanish is so easy to learn blah 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 and i'm just like yeah i've been taking classes now for two years and i still feel like i'm still speaking like this when i talk to people because it's just not easy but your spanish is coming along great you know i hear it and i'm just like oh wow (laughs) so you don't even realize how good you are until somebody tells you you know i know or until you do something that you've never done before like the first time i called and ordered chinese food and (laughs) and and did it right (laughs) (laughs) it's so funny because there's this mexican restaurant that you know that we go to a lot and Every time I call, I'm always in English. She switches to English. But then I started speaking just in Spanish. And then I realized she didn't realize it was me. And then when she says, what's the name on the reservation? And I tell her, she's like, oh, it's you. And then she switches. But the first time I was just like, oh, yeah. And I mean, I did the dance. I told everybody. It's a great feeling. You know, is it an experience that you would? Okay. Before, I guess, before one of the last questions I want to ask you is you've are, you know, you've gotten, I know you bought a, a house for yourself and you've been redoing it and doing it for scratch. How was that whole process of buying property in Valencia, uh, in the, the Valencia, in Segunda, in the Valencia region? And how was that experience? Um, it was actually not terrible. We got tired. We've rented twice before and renting here is very different than in the U S oh, there's yeah. no park complexes unless you can find an individual that wants to rent to you in that city and is willing to accept you. And it's harder with kids. Um, it can just be, you know, for the first few days we were here, we didn't know if we would find anything and we thought we we're going to have to give up before we even really got started. Mm-hmm. Um, that was really scary. Buying the house. We used savings and bought it cash. I was mm-hmm. really transparent um, on uh, one of the Facebook groups of, of other people that were uh, looking to become expats. Our house was 35,000 euro. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then with all of the fees and taxes and, and transferring the deed and all of that stuff, it came out to be just under 45,000. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have spent another 40,000 um, at least probably 45 if you're counting all the other little things we've done. But it looks awesome. <laughs> it's coming out so nice. Yes. <laughs> um, 
to be able to have something and still squeak in under a hundred thousand and it's exactly how you want it exactly without more space and enough room for the kids and dog and cat and cat right <laughs> yes. oh i didn't even know that i thought it was this one <laughs> no two of them came from the states and one of them uh, uh. my cat sitting for six months now ah, I see <laughs> so it's it's not an experience that is just traumatic like we didn't have a traumatic I think you could do a little bit of uh homework you know you can definitely oh, yeah. do it even if you're not familiar with the way things work I mean that was another accomplishment just like you that we were really happy to be able to to do and it makes you feel that do you think that it makes you feel more part of like more grounded like you feel like you belong a lot more because you it own does. something there I, I well, in that. our street is surprisingly multicultural like next door our neighbors are from Belgium and the Philippines and across the street from Argentina and we didn't even know that before we moved in um, but buying the house the only thing we were kind of really sticklers about that I might not have done in the U.S. was having a lawyer for the whole process and because in the U.S. I know how to look up tax records I yeah. still would have got title insurance um but like just having someone read over everything, making sure it's a legal home that you're yeah. allowed to live in, yeah. making sure that we have the right to sell it. Yeah. Um, having a lawyer. I mean, like everything that I would not. Hmm? Oh, having a lawyer is one thing that you would not. I wouldn't do away with. Like yeah. some people, oh, I can do it myself. No. No, absolutely it's not. Yeah, because everything goes here. It's not like there where you buy the house. Here, everything, the old debt, everything goes with the house. It doesn't go with the person there. So if no. all these things are not checked out and you don't have free clearance and you don't have, you know, the right permits and all that, you're the one who gets stuck with it. Not them. Absolutely. They just go and it just goes with the house. So there's so many things. And that's one of the things I tell people when they ask me. And I've written blogs about it. I'm just like, you need to do your homework. There are some things, and I just, there are some things that I tell people, you can do it the right way. You can, you know, chip it up and do it. <laughs> but you'll end up paying for it sooner or later. Because I get people oh, yeah. saying, I go, I don't waste my time telling you all this stuff. There are some things that you need to pay for to get the right information. Because for everybody's like, oh, well, I can get it on the internet. Well, go right ahead, but then don't come crying when, because, you know, you've seen it a lot of times where people get screwed because they didn't do the right homework. And that's just too bad for them, but I'm glad it's that It's really yours... unfortunate. Some of these houses are not legal houses yeah. and then you can't get in Padron and without in Padron, you can't it's... continue any residency that you have yeah. or anything like that. Yeah. You can't enroll your kids in school. Yeah. Like there's a million dominoes that, that, you know, that could have been avoided by paying a lawyer. I mean, it's just, that's just the way things are. It's not like you have it at home. You have to adjust yourself to where you are, not hope that things will run the way that you're used to just because you're here. It doesn't work that way. So now you've been busy, you know, talking to the handyman and the, the work crew and you've been doing it so you know it's a big accomplishment because you were able to do it in Spanish because hardly anybody speaks English you know so yeah you no. be able to even though they're expats all over the place so you were talking about you have to kind of start your own family with everybody around right so yeah. do you do you feel like you've been able to accomplish that I know the answer but do you feel like you've been able to accomplish that and have you know that nucleus of family and friends that you can count on we're still obviously, I mean, it's only been four and a half years and only two and a half years in Valencia. Mm -hmm. So that I feel like there are a couple of people that we know here that I would consider almost extended family. One of which I knew before we even moved here, he moved here because we moved here first oh, and great. kind of, uh, helped him with his process mm -hmm. it's happening it really depends on where you live and unfortunately most of the people that it's happening i say unfortunately because it doesn't feel like i'm 
very integrated because of it. Most of the people that we become closest with are other expats. Okay. Well, They're it not makes famous. sense. Well, it makes sense because, you know, the Spanish are kind of closed off. They, they not closed off, like not warm, but nobody's in, nobody's out there trying to make friends because they, they grew up with the same nucleus of friends and family. And it's really tough to get into there. And once you do, yeah, it's good. But for the most part, They've had the same friends since they were little. Yeah. And mm-hmm. they don't travel often or go, you know, places. And so it's really hard to break in there. But there's nothing wrong with having other expats as friends. The whole point is to have people that make you feel like family, that have your back, and they can help you out with things. So, you know, I think that's the way it is, no matter what country you're in. It's just the way life is, really. It's hard to make friends unless you're kids don't care they just run around and they make friends but when you're an adult oh, yeah, you're a they're little more great. reserved exactly you're a little more they're reserved just- you're a little more like you know just and and I don't know if you feel the same way but the way I feel is like just because I'm here and I'm missing my family or whatever I'm not going to go out and make friends with you just because we're both expats you have to be a good person or you can just you know <laughs> and that's just the way it is so there's no desperation in it it's just that's just the way it is <laughs> Right. For, for us, I think, uh, again, going back to the kids, we moved, obviously, from Basque Country to here when we first got here. If if I could do it again, I would have really, really tried to and had the money. Mm-hmm. I would have really tried to visit and explore an area, pick one area with my kids mm-hmm. and come and stay. Okay. Now we're OK and they're mm-hmm. making friends and really settling down and doing well. If. Around middle school, though, that age, that 11, 12, is when the friendships that matter start. So having a son when we first moved, ready, turning 12, um, I, I kind of, if I could do it again, I would pick, do as much research as I can in advance, knowing that I wasn't just going to try out different places. Right. That's really good to know because it's something that, that needs to be considered by anybody going to, you know, looking to come in. You have to do your research. You have to talk to people who've experienced that thing. I get a lot of requests. And that was one of the reasons I really wanted to talk to you because I get a lot of requests from people saying, well, I have three kids and they're like nine. And, and I'm like, I'm not, I don't have kids. And I'm not in a position to tell you that. But what I can tell you is because they say like things like we're going to move. It doesn't, you know, and then the kids are almost have like an afterthought, like, you know, what should I, and it's like, no, you need to, you have to like do it in some steps and it's not, Like, I'll just move and then they'll fend for themselves. I know kids can fend for themselves, but is it really fair to do it? I don't know. I will say the first year we moved, it was a little bit of that um, almost dictator attitude where we're moving to another country. And then we had a short list of places we were able to move to because that's another part of Mm -hmm. immigrating. Mm -hmm. Can't live wherever you want. Yeah. (laughs) Unless you're rich, right? (laughs) Oh, yeah. If you're rich, yes. Yeah. We're not rich. <laughs> if you're if you're filthy rich, you can live wherever you want. It's not a problem. Yeah. But um, for us, we had the short list. However, I can say with complete honesty, from that point on, every year as a family, we have voted on whether or not we want to stay here, go back to the U.S., or try somewhere else. Okay. Now, do you think that you would ever go back to the U.S. like to live permanently? I don't want to say never because you never know what's going to happen. Um, My mom is still alive. I don't know if she would need extra help, um, you know, in the future, things like that. Uh, That I can't say for sure. I can say as of right now, again, this is what I tell people that live here. Objectively speaking, there is less crime. The healthcare system is better. The school system is better. The work-life balance, the amount of mandatory vacation days, maternity leave, uh, paid time off, all of that is better here. Um, what about the cost it, of school? Well, you know, you, you, you talk about like, oh what, my God, the oldest the one is going to college. Exactly. I already to go to school in the U.S. That is a 
a hundred percent on you. I will pay for school in Europe because it's next year. Because <laughs> it's just two or three thousand dollars as opposed to fifty thousand. Oh, I don't believe you. You know, you have to like get another you have to like sell Where are you getting an entire something. degree in the US for fifty thousand? Yeah. Nowhere. Not yeah. anymore. Yeah. Oh really? <laughs> yeah. No, it's really bad. Yeah. Um, it's really gotten kind of kind of not kind of. It, it's gotten crazy. Um, mm -hmm. no, here that that that's another thing. So for for the safety, health, security, mental health of my family, mm -hmm. like right now, it's literally better here. Mm -hmm. And that's just like as an overall for the average person that lives here. Yeah. That's just how it is. Yeah. So it's not even my opinion. Yeah. So the, the, the cost of living, which is one of the things that's brought everybody here, how, you know, you don't have to give me like an exact figure, but if you, what would you say if I asked you, hey, a family of five, if I made this much money, would I be okay? Like just guesstimate for me, just for somebody listening. From Renting or owning your home, that makes a big difference. Uh, maybe if I didn't have to worry about rent, yeah, owning okay. your home. So for us, we can be okay with a thousand euro a month. And that's a family of five, sure. three growing boys. That's a and family of five, three growing boys. We can be okay. The okay means we're not worried about food. We're not worried about utilities. As long as we're conservative, we're not being crazy. Mm -hmm. um, we're not worried about day-to-day -day things. Mm -hmm. Now, if you add in vacations and eating out and things like that, that number does go up. Mm -hmm. But that's even with going out every once in a while and like living your life, but not vacations. Exactly. I would think that our vacations get to be a bit more. Yeah, yeah. So... If you have two thousand a month, you're good. You're I imagine good. that. Well, Where could you? I mean, like two thousand a month, barely paid for the insurance of the car and and the house when we were back there. So it was just like, you know, it was a no brainer. And I know people fear is something that keeps people back from doing all these things, but you have to look past your fear. Like when you first started looking into, you know, I need to do this. I've got three boys. I want to move to Europe. This were some of the things that you were obviously thinking about. But you were fearful, I would assume, because I can't imagine anybody just saying, no, I'm going to do it and then just do it. But you have to power through that. And what, what advice would you give to somebody who's in America or wherever, who keeps, because, you know, there can be a million reasons not to do something if you set your mind to it. What advice would you give for somebody who's looking to do something like that? It's different for everyone. And, and out in my case in particular, um, my, all of my children are young black men and being a young black man in the United States has never been ideal. It's true. Since the beginning of the country, mm -hmm. it's never been ideal. Mm -hmm. Um, it seemed unfair to make them grow up where we're having to have conversations about what you have to do if you get stopped by the police in order to not die. Mm -hmm. um, where they were growing up and having active shooter drills in class and coming yeah. home and telling me about it. Yeah. You know, oh, and, and then she rattled the door really hard and banged on it, but we had to be very, very quiet. We couldn't say anything. Like, I can't imagine what that does over years to a child's psyche. Yeah. So it's it's those types. Of, it's automatically my my sons are all quite tall for their age. Mm -hmm. Black men that are taller are often viewed as someone who's right. visually threatening. Yeah. No matter how old they are. So even though they're young, and I mean, there's little boys yeah. in their mind. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it's, for me, 
the the fear of change, the fear of learning another language, the fear of getting comfortable in a different culture. None of that was enough for me to say that my fear was more than what their fear would be in the U.S. just living every single day. Yeah, yeah. that makes so sense. So that, that was... I know it's different for everyone. And I know a lot of your, your viewers won't identify with this, but I I couldn't in good conscience, let my boys be subject to that, you know, nonstop. We still visit the U S so they still know the rules, Mm -hmm. but I, I, I couldn't make them live in that all the time. And it, it shows no sign of Jing any time in the near future. Yeah. Now, you're not retired by any chance. You still go and do nursing when you go to America. How often do you have to do, do you have a mindset of like, I'm going to go there, you know, punch in a bunch of hours. That's what one of my older sisters does. You know, <laughs> She goes there, punches a whole bunch of hours, saves up money and then comes back and lives oh, a yeah. good life. And then, I, so it can be done. You know, I once interviewed a lady who was a bicontinental air hostess. You know, she was in Madrid and the US and people say, I can't do this. I can't do this. But you're perfect. You're a perfect example of like, if there's a will, there's a way kind of thing. And there's so many things that you've got to think outside the box. But, you know, it's not like I can only do that after I'm retired, because here you are, you know, we're close to being retired, but you're managing to do it. And, you know, you're living a good life. And you've heard, it's not like you're out there every night, like you're saying, living the vacation mode, you live in the living mode, you know, People are like, what do you do all day? You're in Spain. I'm like, well, I do the groceries. I do, you know, the wash it up things that you do at home. Only you do it yeah. in a different country, you know. So it's doable if you want to do it. So I'm glad you said that. You know, you have to think about things and don't let fear stop you. I, you know, from what I gather, that's what you your message is to everybody. It's that. And also now with my children, I'm trying to help them look at careers that are easily transferable or things that they could possibly do remotely in the future so that they have the continued flexibility because I have it because of the nursing situation in the U.S. and being able to do travel nursing. And that's been a thing for, you know, decades. My husband doesn't have it. So he's only been able to work as a teaching assistant here until just recently, because I've gotten my citizenship, Mm -hmm. he'll be able to work here. But other than that, he hasn't been able to do it. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's another thing. If there's a way that if you know that in the future you want to move abroad, start thinking about more flexible careers in advance. Yeah. Don't get your career. So like for me, um, if we're talking numbers, Nurses in Valencia, on average, earn two thousand euro a month. I like. I know this. <laughs> it's, mm. it's an easily it's just, Googleable yeah. fact. Yeah, yeah. That's what it is. Whereas I can go back to the U.S. and, like you said, put in tons of hours, and in a three month or two month even assignment, depending on how much I'm working um, during COVID. Now, mm-hmm. now I don't know because mm-hmm. with COVID we were able to work and not able. If there were a lot more hours, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but three months, definitely I can go and work and make almost or more than what the nurses here make all year. Uh-huh. And then for the rest of the year, I can be mom yeah. and be with my kids yeah. and we can have vacations and relax and have a good life. Yeah. It's great because, you know, I think a lot of times and sometimes I feel terrible suggesting to people Cause like my nieces, for instance, you know, they're, they were, I guess you're tougher on them because even when I was a kid, I wanted to be a secretary. I wanted to, cause I liked the sound of the typewriter. I liked the, you know, so I was taking classes towards that end. And my mom was like, uh, no, you're going to be, you know, the usual, you're from Nigeria, you'll be a doctor, a lawyer, or a doctor. You know? There were two choices for doctor and one for lawyer. <laughs> 
<laughs> so I was all like, I became a pharmacist, but I had sisters who wanted to go into like some weird things. Like, what? No, my mom was like, no, because you're not going to have, you know, any use for that stuff. Even back then, I'm 50 something. And even back then she knew like, you were not going to be able to parlay that into a good paying job. And she's always like, you don't want to be disappointed by a guy you always want. And I think a lot of times when you're younger, you need to start thinking of what can I use this? Cause life is long. You know, if you're going to live to be 80, you need, you don't want to get a career in basket weaving or some, you know, weird thing like that, that you spend $50,000 a month and you get out of school and there's no jobs left. So you need to start thinking, like you said, and yeah. it's great that you're, you're thinking that for your boys too, because you could always say, oh, I'm doing okay, and they'll be fine. But you're also thinking of what if they want to move out of Spain and they, you want something they can move with, which is fantastic. And I think sometimes you think like, well, you know, it should be up to the kids. Uh, it should be, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but there should be some little pushing over there somewhere, I think. No, I think that like, <laughs> There are certain careers that you need to have a personal passion for. If you don't want to be a nurse, please don't be a nurse. Exactly. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> please don't be a nurse just for yeah. the money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the world will thank you. Right? Oh, my goodness. So there are some careers that you need to have a personal passion for um, to be able to do. But... It's much easier to be a happy person and to feel fulfilled and to live the life that you want if your job isn't the only thing. You, you should work to live, not live to work. Okay. And that's what they do here. Yeah. So they do think about, you know, what can I do that not benefits the society because they have a lot more. Um, positions for funcionarios and things like that mm -hmm. that benefits the society and I can have a decent living yeah. so it doesn't uh, if you are making enough money as a lawyer or a doctor but you always wanted to be an artist you're going to have more money for paintbrushes yeah <laughs> <laughs> or do it like you do half the time do this and then the other half do you know whatever <laughs> Yes, yeah, and right now I'm, I'm I'm enjoying being with my. This is like right now I'm taking several months off, and it's partially for my mental health. COVID has been hard on nurses. Yeah, yeah, really, really hard. Yeah. So it's so that when I do go back, I still have that passion and that enthusiasm and things like that. I don't. Uh, the times that I've gone back during COVID have only been after a rest of a couple of months. Yes. Yeah. So that when I go back, I am the best that I can be because you've had that. No one wants right. to be in the hospital with a nurse that is no. equally exhausted. Exactly. <laughs> Well, Shakira, this has been a wonderful, wonderful interview. I am so glad I got a chance to talk to you because, you know, like I said, I've been having some requests and I'm just like, well, I have to find where she has the time because every time I look up, I was like, she's off to the US again working, you know, because, you know, you responded to the help, I mean, the, the, the need for help there. And I thought that was a great thing because a lot of people could have easily said, you know what, I'm out of it. I'm in, you know, I'm in Spain. I don't need to be worrying about that, you know, but you were like, no, let's go, let's go do it. And it felt pretty you know. crappy to be like, I'm here and they need that. Cause I didn't feel like I could help as much here because the language barrier was still really strong. Yes, yeah. And when there's an emergency, you don't want to be like, yeah. Despacito, por favor. Yeah. You no. can't do that. <laughs> so I, I did really, really feel the need to help. And I know we didn't talk about um, I guess religion or anything, but but I am Jewish and, and it is a mitzvah where if you can help, you should. Yeah. Uh, and it was something that I I felt like uh, it was was very necessary. And it, I, I had none of the major risks. So it was less of a risk for me than a lot of the nurses that I knew that were working in the U.S. that have diabetes and high blood yeah. pressure and asthma yeah. and all these other things. It just it didn't seem OK to just sit and watch it on TV. Yeah. Now, um, you, you mentioned I was going to. I was going to close out the um, 
the conversation, but then I just realized, yeah, you mentioned being Jewish. Now, Sagunto is known as a very big Jewish area. Was it easier to integrate into the Jewish society? Oh, there, there? aren't any living Jews here anymore. No, it just was past <laughs> history? Because no, that's, no, that's the one the thing. History. Ah, okay. I know one other Jewish person in the whole town. Gotcha. <laughs> and I know of them. Okay. I've never met them. Got it. I've been to synagogue in Valencia and ah. two different people have said, oh, I think, you know, I think I have a friend who's Jewish. Who Jewish. Lives <laughs> but I know there is a bagel shop in, in Sagunto, isn't there? There is a shop now that sells challah and ah. that's new in Mata. Oh. Um, but I have to come out there. Uh, but they're also open there. The, the shop itself, the owners aren't Jewish. Um, there's a lot of people that have Jewish heritage here. Gotcha. Okay. So that, that's, that's been, you know, it, it's close to Valencia and Valencia has four synagogues. Mm -hmm. That was on the list of things. We wanted to be close to, uh, our religious community as well. Got it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's great. But no, the kit, the, the, as far as like, I guess, wrapping up healthcare system here is just objectively better. I can't really... <laughs> you can't fudge it. <laughs> get all the tests, it's objectively better for the reasons that we said. The kids have objectively better education on average. Obviously, there are some schools in the U.S. that uh, blow some schools here out of the water, but on average, the education system here is better. Uh, my children, personally, their reason for voting to stay here every year has been freedom. <laughs> they can. They said when they visit the U.S. with people they have to ask grandma to drive them somewhere and yeah. they, they have to ask if someone can take them to the park or yeah. wherever and here yeah. they can literally just walk, just walk almost anywhere and their friends come over and ring the doorbell and can Dylan come out and play oh yeah sure okay yeah. <laughs> it makes a big so difference that, yeah that's different they can have their own a life. lives a little bit that's and so great. they, they so, love so that can you. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's nice. yeah. It's nice. That's um, great. Other than and the work life balance here for me is better, but not just for me, the government mandated amount of days off for people who are from here. They get more time off. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so it makes everyone a little bit more relaxed. And it's nice to be able to hop a plane. Like yes. this weekend I'm going to Sweden. Uh, to help someone bring someone oh, in their yeah. cat. Oh yeah, I two weekends. Of, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Two weekends. I'm yeah. going to Paris because yeah. it was only seventy euro. Yeah, so exactly. Why not? With, a, yeah. with a girlfriend of mine, like yeah. it's. <laughs> uh oh, Wick. I don't know what's happening to the. It's it's amazing. <laughs> yes, life is amazing. It's been so, great yeah. once again. Shakira, thank you. Everybody, you've heard it here. You finally got your interview with somebody with kids who's living here, who's making it work and on a budget. And so this is showing you another side of life that you may not have thought of, but you should probably be thinking of it because the ultimate purpose is to make a better life for you and your kids or your husband or whatever. So, you know, food for thought here. So thank you so much, Shakira, for coming on. It's been great. And everybody, we will see you. No problem. <laughs> Bye. Can, can I say one thing? Oh, please can, do. Can, can I say one thing? Please do. Any parents who come, give it a minimum of six months for the decision of whether or not to stay, preferably a year. Okay. But don't make any decisions before the right first away. six months. It's true. That's true. Great advice. That's the only <laughs> thing that I would say. Great. That's great advice. Thank you. Thank you thank so you, much. Bye. We'll see everybody later.